guys, welcome back to the channel Daughter of Increase. My name is Nate Denise for those of you who are new to the channel. And I post new videos every Tuesday and Thursday all about my faith, God, Christ, and expanding the kingdom of God. Today's video we are going to be picking back up into John chapter 4. This is going to be the last portion of John chapter 4. So this is part 3. If you haven't seen part 1 or part 2, definitely check out those videos. And let me just bring my mic up quickly. Um, and I'm trying to, okay, here it is. But, yeah, so the Bible that I'm using, for those of you who are new to the channel, I'm, or the Facebook group, I use the Single Column Journaling Bible in the ESV translation. It's from Crossway. That is the Bible that I use. I, however, do prefer the New King James translation. I will start incorporating that type of translation on my channel next year. But when I do online Bible studies or like do anything as far as studying the word with you guys, I prefer to use the ESV English Standard Version because a lot of you guys um, are either new to the faith, new to studying the Bible, or just find it hard to comprehend other translations. And I find that the ESV is kind of like the base line translation in my opinion. So that is that. Um, so yeah, I have the... Pigma Micron 01 Archival Ink Pen. It's a .25 millimeter pen. I am going to be using the Crayola Super Tip Markers as well as the Sharpie Smear God Highlighters. These are the ones that don't have the clips on them. I get these from Rite Aid for like three bucks. So, I just had all of those there. I did, however, go to the store and pick up some of the Pilot G207 pens. Um, these are the 0.7 ballpoint. I'm sorry, the 0.7 gel pens. And um, yeah, I got these because I want to go back into using blue ink in my Bible. Because in my old Bible, if you guys have seen my uh, what is it called? My journaling Bible, how I study the word, um, you would see that I was using blue ink just because it doesn't kind of fight with the black ink text. But yeah, I also have a black ink pen, just a regular pen. This is a 0.7 gel oil pen, and I got this from like the discount store <laughs> for like a dollar and some change. So, I'm going to quickly do a simple prayer. It is late as I am recording this. Um, yeah, it's pretty late right now as I'm recording this video for you guys, but I wanted to have this video up for you guys tomorrow, which is Tuesday. Um, and then I'm going to work on chapter 5 Wednesday so I can have that uploaded. And chapter 5 will most likely be done in two parts. Yes. Chapter 5 will definitely be a two-parter video. But um, anyway, I'm going to quickly pray us in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to spend this time in your word, Father God. We are appreciative of the way that we are able to just come to your word openly and freely and to be able to understand and communicate with you, Father God. I'm asking that you allow me to be used as your vessel to help expand the knowledge of your word to those who are watching, whether they're new in their faith or new to studying the word, God. I ask that you allow me to just be of assistance to them in their studies at this time. God, give us the discernment to understand your word deeper and better and allow us to be able to apply this word to our daily lives and in our hearts amen so you guys may hear movement in the background my son is sleeping <laughs> i'm going to try to not to speak too loud which is why i moved the mic up but when i edit this video i'll edit the audio volume anyways but okay so for those of you who are new to my channel or new to the facebook group um, the way that I study is I kind of use different steps. So the first step that I do is I read through and it really just depends on the text. If I'm reading the Psalms and it's like 10 verses, I'll read the whole Psalms if need be. If I'm doing something like John or the Gospels or the Prophets, I'll go paragraph by paragraph. Or in some cases, like when the paragraphs are really short, I'll combine paragraphs. It's basically just read a block or a chunk of the scripture first. So that's what I do, and I simply read it through just to have it in my mind and ingrain it. I don't make any markings, I just read it through. The second time I go in, I circle words that I want to define, be it words that I do know or words that I don't know. 
because words have different definitions um, as far as in the context in which the word was written. So the Old Testament, the original language for that was in Hebrew, and in the New Testament, it's Greek. So as far as us studying John, I would look up the Greek definition. Now sometimes there are just some words where you can look up the Greek, and it won't be, it, it really won't give you a true definition. So then you can just look it up in the English just to understand it. It really all just depends, but um, that's the second step. The third step, once I define my words, is I read it through again. But as I'm reading this time, I underline or box things that stand out to me, parts of the scriptures, part, I mean, parts of the verses, whole verses, um, key points that I really think are like valuable. And then from there, I go and make my notes. And once I make my notes, I add color, which you guys can see here. So I circle words that I wanted to define, which Marvel, we all know what Marvel is. We hear it all the time. It's like to wonder, to admire, but I still wanted to look up the definition and I did over here you can't see that we um looked up the definition here so that's pretty much how that goes so we're basically gonna quickly read through i'm gonna read from 39 to 43 sorry 39 to 45 and then i'm gonna end off for 46 to 54 and then that'll be it for john chapter 4 thank god <laughs> then we can move on to chapter 5 and for those of you who are new to the daughter of increase or doi bible studies thank you for joining whether you're a man woman young kid adult teenager whatever the case i really do appreciate you guys um watching the bible studies and being able to get some like substance i guess if you will from these bible studies i am not by any means a theologian <laughs> i am not a pastor i am none of that yes i do hold position in my church um but not on like a leadership type of you know ministerial type of thing i was at one point in time a minister in training but then i took myself out of that <laughs> um i know when, when i say i took myself out of that i mean that i stepped down on my own accord though i do know the calling on my life um it's been prophesied to me ministered to me and the lord has shown it to me what my purpose i guess you would say is so yeah just keep in mind i did not go to seminary i am not by any means a pro at this this is just me doing an in-depth bible study on my own and sharing it with you guys so that we may all be able to get a lot out of the word if you have any comments questions thoughts if you get your own things definitely just leave your comments down below i like communicating with you guys and i do do live bible study sessions on tuesdays and or thursdays um and the daughter of increase facebook group but recently it's, it hasn't been going if you guys saw part two you would understand what happened last week which is why part two had to be recorded and i'm recording this now because i'm going to be going out with my mom she has to get a procedure done and i'll be taking care of her for six weeks so i'm going to be doing a lot of pre-recording for the videos and as far as john as a whole i'm sorry i'm taking too long to talk i'm going to get into the study real quick soon um but as far as john i my initial thoughts was i wanted to finish john before the end of 2018 that way in 2019 i could start fresh with new studies and new ideas and things like that but in thinking that way i realized um rushing isn't doing anything for anybody especially since Though I've already studied John personally on my own, going through it a second time, I'm picking up things that I didn't pick up the first time I studied it. So I know if I'm getting stuff out of it, I know that you guys are too. And I don't want to rush it. I don't want people to feel like it's going too fast, but I don't want it to move too slow either. So I'm not sure when live videos will start back up. Hopefully, I'm fingers crossed I can start doing them at least by mid-October. But um, for now, they're going to be pre-recorded and my goal is to finish up to john chapter 10 before christmas um the week before christmas i want to be done with john chapter 10 and then we're going to take a break and then after new year's i'll dive back in starting with john chapter 11 going all the way through to 21 um because i don't want to rush and i do want you all to be able to get the notes and though these are my personal notes and personal thoughts and stuff that i find through research commentaries and just praying over the scriptures I definitely want you guys to go and study it for yourself. Next year when I do these studies, it will be a little bit different 
just because I do put my heart and soul <laughs> into studying the word, obviously. Um, you guys have seen my extensive notes. I do also have printable notes that I do. This one is nine pages, so like I, I do a lot of like research in studying the word. Um, but in me doing that, I feel like I'm giving it to you guys so easily that you don't have to study it for yourself. So next year, the notes are going to be a little bit different. Um, not as extensive, just so that you guys are... Um, are studying it for yourselves outside of what I'm sharing. Hopefully that made sense. I literally just spent a whole bunch of time talking. So let's just dive right into this video. Alright, so starting with verse 39. Let me make sure the mic is properly in. It'll be one thing if I'm recording and the mic is not going. <laughs> so, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told, oh, basically, we are in chapter 4. I should have said this before, but a recap quickly. We basically went through the portion where um, the Samaritan woman now goes back to the town people. And she basically gives her testimony about who Christ is um, and what he's done for her. And this now sparks an interest in the other people of the town being interested in him. And these are Samaritans, okay? So going back, 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. 41. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Verse 43. After the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Gal Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So I read that too, so now we're going to just go and circle words, okay? I'll get So the first word I want to circle is... In verse 38 no nope, sorry okay so the words that I have left are actually not even for this they're actually go back into the, the part that we did last week but if you have the principle and um, you'll be able to see those words so I have no words to circle for this portion but um, I mean if you wanted to you could circle Samaritans and find the definition of that you can circle testimony you could circle um, believed you could circle heard um i mean there's so many words that you could circle whether you know them or not to get a deeper understanding but now i'm just going to dive right back into yeah i'm going to just dive back into um just underlining and stuff like that so 39 i'm going to start off with that verse and i'm going to underline many samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony I'm also going to underline the portion that says, he told me all that I ever did. So, the reason why I underlined the first part of that scripture is because um, at that moment, they did not know enough to trust Jesus and his work on the cross, but they believed in him by the word of the woman's testimony. So, because they didn't know Jesus personally, they had to listen to the testimony of someone who had an interaction with him, an experience with him. And this tells me that testimonies are very powerful whether someone knows you or not it's kind of like if there is how can i say a stranger right and they're looking for somebody reliable but they don't know anyone they're going to listen to the testimonies of other people to find somebody reliable that's kind of how i went with these people the samaritans didn't know anything about jesus they didn't know who he was um, or whatever the case may be but through her testimony they were able to see physically see the effect that he had on her especially since she's well known obviously in her town um, so they were able to see the effect so this tells me that her testimony was powerful the word that you have the testimony that you have to share with others is very powerful and it can bring others to the cross it can bring others to Christ so that Christ can do the work that God had him to do 
So I thought that was just amazing. So I'm going to simply put my notes here. Um, and I'm, I shorthand my notes. So if you want the full thing of what I just said, download the printable. The link is down below in the description bar. And if you can't access it, comment and let me know because I know sometimes it's hard for you guys to get it. So I might have to switch over to Dropbox if Google Drive doesn't work perfectly. But um, they did not know or trust him. But her testimony... And the next portion says, he told me all that I ever did. Um, basically, Jesus knew the facts of her life, but he loved her even knowing the facts of her life. So sometimes, um, we sometimes fear that if someone knew all that we ever did, they could not love us. But we see that Jesus, despite knowing all that she did, she's done, he knows that she's been married five times. He knows that she's shocking up. Um, and obviously if she was married five times, he knows that she's had sex with all of these different men. And though they were married, in the eyes of God, it's not really considered a marriage. Especially since they divorced, we know that divorce is an abomination. It's in, uh, Malachi chapter 2, I can't remember the verse. But, um, I'll leave it on the screen, or actually I'll put it down below in the, um, description. But, in spite of him knowing all that, he still loved her. So that shows you how deep his love for us as a people is, um, is, <laughs> how deep his love for us is. So, um, he loved her. Even knowing her unpleasant past. And I know a lot of us feel that way. We feel like, um, you know, I can't tell so-and-so this because then so-and-so is not going to love me enough. Or they're not going to care about me enough. Or they're going to start to think negatively about me. But if this person does love you and you tell them something that had took place in your life that was unpleasant, it shouldn't deter them from loving you. It, it really shouldn't, especially since Jesus was not turned off from us. I mean, he died for us while we were in our sinfulness. Come on now. So, knowing her unpleasant lifestyle, slash past, all right. Going on to 40, I'm going to underline the portion that says they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. So for that portion again, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. This was a remarkable, I'm sorry, this was remarkable considering the opinions of most of the Jewish people of Jesus' day regarding the Samaritans. They regarded Samaria and the Samaritans as a place and a people to avoid if possible. And if it were necessary to go through Samaria, it should be done as quickly as possible. Yet Jesus saw a people with a need. He didn't see a people that was different from him. He didn't see um, them as the world saw them. He saw them in the way God wanted him to see them he saw people that needed Christ so he didn't care about the cultural differences he didn't care about how everyone else saw them which I think is, an, is amazing not only did he not care about the cultural boundaries as far as speaking to a woman he also spoke to a Samaritan woman by herself and then he also stayed in Samaria two more days now mind you he didn't have to go through Samaria. I mean, this is Christ we're talking about. He didn't have to. He could have took the regular route. He could have just, I don't know, done some magic or whatever the case may be to get where he needed to go. But he knew he had a divine appointment, not just for this woman, but for the people of Samaria as well. So, <clears throat> sorry about my voice. 
but I think that's awesome. So that was verse 40, right? Yes. So verse 40. Jesus saw a people with a need. That's as simple as that. He didn't see Samaritans. He saw a people who needed him, who needed God in their lives. Going ahead to verse 42, because I don't have anything for 41. But um, basically the whole quote of what the people said to the woman was really it was just really amazing. So, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. So, I'm underlining that as one section. Sorry about that clicking. Um, and then I'm going to underline the last portion. For we have heard ourselves and we know that it is, this is indeed the Savior of the world. So, as that is going, I'm going to start popping on some color. Because y'all should know me by now. I need color in my life. And again, these are the Crayola Super Tip Markers. They don't bleed as much as other markers, and they have fun colors, and I like them. Nope, don't want that one. color is down so 42 okay so again starting off with the portion that said is it is no longer because of what you said that we believe basically there will come a time when people will need to take the initiative to learn more about Christ and God on their own we can't always live off the testimony and or knowledge of the people around us, such as our parents and grandparents and sisters and brothers, we must learn an experience on our own to deepen that belief. And I think that's in important because they said it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. So that's now telling me that you took it upon yourself to get to know Christ. You took it upon yourself to have a relationship with him instead of staying in the dark and living off of my testimony because your testimony is just that it's your testimony it gets you through it can help bring someone but it can't keep that person with christ they from your testimony they have to be able to come to the cross and decide to have a personal relationship based off of your testimony your testimony is kind of like um a lighthouse if you will um you sharing your testimony with others lets them see that they're going, even if they're going through the same thing, you got through it somehow, you're still, you still have joy, you still have peace, you're still laughing, you're still smiling, despite what you've gone through, and that their situation is a little different, they're not as happy, or they're not um, as, as joyful or peaceful as you are, so now, from your testimony, and from seeing you, because you yourself are a living testimony, obviously. But from hearing your testimony about Christ and then seeing you being a living testimony, they now can come to the cross and see, okay, I can either have a personal relationship with Christ on my own or continue down the route that I'm continuing. But um, it, it just amazes me that these Samaritans, the very people that the Jewish people tried to ignore and keep in a box, um... Jesus said, no, these are people who need me. They need to hear me. They need to know me. And he took it upon himself to do that. And through the testimony of this woman, basically a lot of people in Samaria, Samaria were um, brought to Christ, which I thought was amazing. So there comes a time when people... Will need to take the
initiative to learn more. about God and experience Christ. That's the first portion. So now we're going on to the second portion when they said, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Basically this remarkable testimony of the woman at the well connected these Samaritans to Jesus, but in hearing him they came to a deeper personal faith in, G in Jesus. So, um, the woman's testimony. Brought them to Christ. But hearing him deepened, oops, their belief. Okay. And for those of you who are new, just know my chick I, I end up writing chicken scratch <laughs> sometimes just because of the way the angle is with the camera and because my hand gets tired so sorry but moving on to 44 for Jesus himself had testified I'm going to underline the part that says let me get in the camera just a little bit more okay so I'm going to underline the part that says that a prophet has no honor in his hometown I'm sorry, guys. Well, I have like three more pages of notes to go, so I'm just making sure. Okay. I think this is the last note for this port, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay. So, anyways, that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. I am going to use this brown. It's a really nice brown color. I really like that color. It's really pretty. But I'm using that, and basically, Galilee was his country where he grew up. Um, these people felt so familiar with Jesus, but they did not honor him the way they should have. And this we recognize that we really were, I'm sorry, and this we recognize that they really were not familiar with Jesus. If they were, they would have honored him all the more. So basically, the, the Galileans had a false familiar, familiarity <laughs> with Christ, is what I'm saying. False. It's kind of like how you say you know somebody, but you really don't know that person. Like, if somebody asks you, like, hey, do you know um, such and such? You're like, yeah, I know them, but I don't really know them like that. That's a false familiar familiarity. Oh, my God, it's hard to say that word at this hour. <laughs> but um, it's kind of like that. So that's pretty much what I'm going to write. False. They don't truly know him. Though, they had total access to them. <laughs> like, it's kind of like when you have total access to a celebrity, um, but you say you know that person just because you see them around your neighborhood, but you don't really know them beyond their name. It's kind of like that. more pages and notes guys all right so i'm going to now read through the last portion i'm going to now read through the last portion because the rest of the notes that i have are for the last paragraph so let's now read the last paragraph and this Last paragraph focuses on the second miracle that has taken place, um, the second sign, the second wonder, if you will. We already know that the first one was turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana, so now we're diving into the second one, and this is titled, Jesus Heals an Official's Son, so I'm going to read it through, circle after, underline, take notes, and add color. 
So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, I think that's how you say that, Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill, 47. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to, Ju to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. 48. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Verse 51. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. 53. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live, and he himself believed in all his household. 54. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. So the only word that I have here is heal, and that is in 47. So I'm just circling that word, and I'm just going to put the definition on the paper. I'm just going to write it here. So the Greek word for that is... Um, I'm going to show you guys the definition in a second because Okay. So here we go. The Greek word for heal is that, and it means to cure of or from physical or spiritual disease or sickness. So that's what I have for that. And all right, almost at the finish line, guys. So I'm just going to box that and circle that so that I know. Okay. Get my lighting right. There we go. So I'm going to jump straight to verse 47 because I have nothing for 46. But um, I'm going to underline the part where it says, He went to him and asked him, to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So, one of many parents who came to Jesus on behalf of an afflicted child, because we know that many people and many parents and family members came to Jesus for the afflictions of others, um, but this man obviously came with a passion and an urgency of a father of a sick child on the verge of death. Um, so this man had a, he had to have had some type of like passion in him because he went directly to Christ. I mean, he could have went to doctors. It doesn't say whether he, you know, went to doctors for a while or something like that. No one knows. It's not like how we know where the woman of, um, with the issue of blood, we know that she had went to many people to try to figure out what was wrong with her it doesn't say that but we but we immediately see that he went down there and spoke to christ directly so he had a passion to get his son healed And directly pleaded, if you will, with Christ. And I just want to state that when I make my notes, um, everything I underline or highlight or whatever, if you don't agree with it, 
don't write it down. Um, if you feel that my notes are not substantial enough, you don't have to uh, write them. I just, I don't know, I felt like I needed to say that because I know some people feel like when they learn something, they have to do it word for word and stuff like that. But that's not what I want you guys to do as far as my channel goes. Um, I know there are some other channels that may do that. But on my channel, I want you to get what you're able to understand. And if it helps with the way I'm doing it, then go for it. But if what I'm saying is different, um, you don't have to do it the way I'm doing it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> but moving on, we're going to go to verse 48. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So basically, Jesus rebuked those who depended on signs and wonders before they would believe. Signs and wonders can lead a person towards belief in God and can validate a heavenly messenger, but they can also have no effect on a person, and Satan can also use lying signs and wonders. So the biggest thing that I have gotten out of that is a question, or rather two questions. Is um, Do you need to see before you believe, and if so, what kind of faith do you have? Because faith is the substance of things not seen, right? I know I just probably said that scripture wrong, but you guys know the scripture, right? Okay. <laughs> it's in Hebrews. Um, so, you know, it, it really makes me wonder because if I have to see the miracle take place before I believe, then is it really faith? I shouldn't have to see it before it takes place i got faith i mean i got major faith there are a lot of things like you guys know how i am with the working i got faith that i'm going to have a job i, I have faith that it's going to come i have faith that i'm going to get married soon i have faith that i'm going to have baby number two i have faith that i'm going to move into a house like i have faith for a lot of these things um and though there are things that are in the way of that taking place i believe and trust in god i have confidence in him that what i believe and what i have faith in is going to take place so i don't need to see the miracles of it happen before i can believe god because i believe him either way whether he does a miracle or not i believe him i got faith so i it just really makes me ask that question of do you need to see before you believe that's really all i, I wrote so do you need to see before you believe? And the second part of that is, if you do need to see it before you believe it, what kind of faith do you have? Because clearly it's not godly faith if you have to see it before you believe it. Going on to 50, as you can see a trend, we're skipping like verses, skipping every other verse. But going to 50, um, it says, go, your son will live. And then I'm going to online the part that says, the man believed the word that spoke to him, that Jesus spoke to him. And went on his way. So let me grow some color because my eyes they not with it right now <laughs> so here we go color here almost done Okay, I'm just keeping track of my camera because it shuts off after like 47 minutes and then I have to restart it. <laughs> so we're at 39 right now, so okay. So go, your son will live. So basically Jesus severely tests this man's faith, forcing him to believe in Jesus' word alone and not in any outward demonstration of the mir of the miraculous Um so, Jesus didn't use any dramatic effects in this healing. You know, many people want to see the dramatic effects um, in God's work. And sometimes God will provide that. But real faith may perceive and accept the outward demonstration of miraculous, but does not require it. So, basically, true faith, you don't require 
the dramatic theatrics to the word of God. If he says it, you believe it and you take that and run with it. So, um, I'm going to say test it. Tested man's faith to believe in his, in his being Jesus' word alone. And not theatrics. And I'm not saying that, you know, the things that Jesus does is like theatrical, but you guys get what I'm saying with all like the hoopla and stuff you don't always need that to believe in the word now if you do that's a problem so we're just going to connect that there where are we at 40 okay So for the second part of that, which is in 50, I'm going to write the 50. Okay. So um, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. So basically the noble man demonstrated true faith in simply taking Jesus at his word without theatrics or seeing him work the miracle. Um, he didn't have to see it. He believed it before he saw the the miracle being performed so um the noble man demonstrated true faith simply by taking Christ at his word. Okay, moving to 52. Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. I'm just going to continue reading through so I can underline. Um... For 53, I have he himself believes in all his household. And then the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. So, I'm going to take this purple. And this blue. Okay, so starting with the 52, is it? Yes. Um, so yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So basically this means that the nobleman took his time to return home from this meeting with Jesus and Cana back to his home in Capernaum. Um, he... Basically, his leisurely pace was a demonstration of faith and fear. The nobleman would have ran from Capernaum to Cana, um, but in faith, he walked from Cana back to Capernaum. So, he never really ran to Christ, and he never ran back to his son. He had some strong faith to take a walk, because, I mean, if my son was on the brink of death, I'm sorry, you guys, I would probably be running running to Christ and running back home though I believe what he said my actions wouldn't show belief so his actions showed belief his actions showed belief as he didn't run home he clearly took his time because this person is saying yesterday so it took you a whole day come on it, it couldn't have been me i'm sorry i would have freaked out and i'm being honest like my son gets a cough and i'm sitting up like Where, where's that cough from 
Um, so he himself believed in all his household. Basically, the miraculous power of Jesus developed greater faith in both the nobleman and his household. He believed before, but now he believed more. His faith was deepened by this personal experience of God's power. So when you have a personal encounter with God um, and you experience his powder, powder, <laughs> power, um, your faith is deepened even more. So, verse 53... Through his personal experience with Christ, his faith deepened and his family believed. So moving on to the final verse, it says in 54, the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea, Judea to Galilee, sorry. So um, the first took place at the wedding in Cana when he turned water into wine and this being the second. The first sign persuaded his disciples. The second sign persuaded a Jewish nobleman and his household. The Samaritans believed without a sign. So these first two signs reveal that Jesus is real in both great times and during a tragedy. So I'm actually going to write that um, at the bottom down here. I know that was terrible, right? I could have just wrote that on the next page. <laughs> Pray for me, guys. <laughs> but um, again, so the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee, basically I wrote again that the first two signs, the sign of um, him turning water into wine at the wedding in Cana, and this and healing the man's son, um, it reveals that Jesus is real in both great times and during tragedy he's not just there in times of you know trouble he's there all the time whether good bad mediocre in between whatever the case but um yeah that was it for my notes as far as the scripture goes so let me just read this last portion that i ended up typing up so we have now completed chapter four um let me zoom out for you guys Oh, I'm zooming in. <laughs> totally said zoom out, but. Nope, that's still not enough. Okay, that should do it. So we have completed chapter four. Here, here, notes, this, th these sticky notes here. All the way to here. I'm not sure if this is also for chapter 4. Yep, we have notes here too. So we just have notes everywhere. Okay, everywhere. But um, the last thing that I want to say is that uh, chapter 4 is all about Jesus saving souls through kindness and testing their faith. The story of the Samaritan woman shows how Jesus loves us despite our past and how the testimony of one can bring many to Christ. Within the first part, we also see that even in helping to bring someone to Christ, they must also be willing to hear and learn from Christ for themselves, which we see with the Samaritans. Um, when they told her back in verse 42, they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves that we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So they would not have known that um, if they didn't hear her testimony, and they would not have listen to him without listening to our testimony so you know um the second half of chapter four which is basically the second miracle 
um, it shows us that we must move in faith and believe the word of God without seeing miraculous things take place. Our faith and trust in God should be from the heart and knowledge of him, not about the things he can do for us and how he does it for us. It's about who he is, not what he does and not why he does it and who he is. So John chapter 4 is beautifully written and it pulls at the heartstrings. Um, and that's pretty much it for chapter 4. I really pray that you all got something out of this chapter. I mean, the first time I studied it, I'm not going to lie, I got nothing. <laughs> but studying it a second time i'm getting so much out of it so um i do want to mention this one the printables that i do for you guys i do have a section that um has a question to ponder and it's basically just a few questions on the scriptures um specifically like you getting it out of the scripture and then i have a few questions that are like personal based off of the scripture so kind of like personal ones would be um what does this show about Jesus' attitude towards other races and aspects I'm speaking about when he stayed with the Samaritans and when he spoke to the Samaritan women? Um, he didn't judge them just because they were Samaritans. He was kind to them. Then I have like list examples of worship that is not in spirit or not in truth. Um, list lessons we can learn about teaching methods from this story of the Samaritan woman at the well. What can this story teach us, especially women, about saving the lost? Um... And then, you know, then I have the ones for the scripture. What offer did Jesus make to the woman at the well? How does God want us to worship him? And how does this relate to his own character? And I'll tell you the verse to get it from. So, pretty much, um, if you guys are interested, like I said, just click down below. If not, leave your email and I will email it to you. Or you can email me personally. My email is daughterofincrease at gmail.com. So, if you need me, you can, you can get to me multiple ways. You can email me. You can comment below. You can hit me up on Instagram, either through a comment or a DM. You can Facebook message me. I mean, my Facebook page is Daughter of Increase. My Facebook group page is Daughter of Increase. So there's always ways to get to me. But um, yeah, this is it for Chapter 4. The topic, again, was Soul, win soul Winner and Second Miracle. And um, I did pick two key verses. I picked... John 4 and 14 which says but whoever drinks of this water that I will give him will never be thirsty again the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life and then John 4 35 which says do you not say there are yet four months when it come then comes the harvest look I tell you lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest so <clears throat> sorry guys my throat like I said it's pretty late I'm gonna go to sleep in a second but, um, yep. Again, these are the notes. You can print these out yourself if need be. Now, not everything that I say is on the notes. Just because a lot of things, um, come to mind are spiritually, spiritual download in which I'll think out. Basically, God will implant something in my mind as I'm reading it with you guys. So, yes, a lot of the things I say sometimes are like a one-hit kind of moment where you just got to replay the video. <laughs> but that's it. Oh, my God, you guys are done with Chapter 4. We are going to be diving into Chapter 5. And then we'll be halfway done with um, the first portion of studying the Gospel according to John. But, yeah, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, anything, just leave it down below. Also, I do have my 1,000... YouTube subscriber uh, giveaway coming soon as well as my Facebook giveaway and my Instagram giveaway. Those videos will hopefully be up next week <laughs> so that I can do those giveaways in October. Um, so yeah, and that's it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.